Okay, great. Uh, w welcome to the next edition of the Arts and Literature section. Um, and so I wanted to use a very specific case study today uh, in Kenya on reforestation, afforestation, deforestation. And I gravitated towards this example for a couple of reasons. First, it allows us to look at the interface between um, physical biology and symbolic biology. In this case, the tree. So there's a, there's a, a physical tree, a biological tree, uh, and there is also a symbolic cultural tree that has political overtones. Okay, so that's one of the sort of motifs that we're looking at in this strand of the course. Uh, a second question that this uh, case helps us ground is um, how are political alliances formed? Uh, what interfaces do environmental activists have with other forms of social activism? So rather than seeing environmental activism in isolation, I think this case reminds us of, of the intersectional dimensions between uh, among different movements for social change, okay? And the third motif is uh, the question of environmental justice. Right at the outset, I talked about environmental justice in terms of unequal burdens on different communities, unequal harms uh, experienced by different communities, by gender, race, class, caste, and so forth. Um, and then also unequal access to resources. So vital resources like breathable air, drinkable water, green space in which to uh, relax and so forth. Okay, so those are three uh, motifs in this strand of the course that I wanted to uh, ground in the example of the Green Belt Movement. Um, so, as we know, uh, deforestation is a um, is in is in a critical concern, particularly in the what I call the, 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 the global midriff, the tropical uh, areas, which are so vital for, um, as, as carbon sinks above all the Amazon. And we know with, with Bolsonaro, uh, the current uh, president of Brazil, there has been uh, a, a spike in deforestation combined with a, um, a, uh, an encroachment on and see, in many cases, seizure of indigenous uh, uh, forested lands, okay? So this isn't only happening in uh, Brazil, it's happening in Indonesia, in the Philippines, in Colombia, in, in a number of other societies that uh, provide a critical, or constitute a critical part of this uh, environmental belt of uh, tropical forests around the center of the earth. So trees also are very deeply enfolded into our figures of speech, into our metaphors. This is uh, Greta Thunberg. We're sawing off the branch we're all sitting on, okay? Um, so I'm, I'm interested in this uh, lecture today in thinking about this metaphoric power of trees. And if we even think about um, the way trees are described and the way human bodies are described, we talk about the limbs of a tree, we talk about the crown of a tree, um, uh, the, the girth of a tree or the girth of a person, okay? So there's a lot of um, correlations between these, uh, these, these, these life forms, homo sapiens and trees. Of course, we're, we're, uh, we're erect as trees are, um, but we're vastly more mobile. And, and so, so there's, there's a lot of play in myth, in, in uh, cinematography, in literature around trees as humans and humans as trees, going all the way back to Ovid, Ovid's Metamorphoses. So this uh, scientific paper in Nature uh, from three year, uh, two years ago got a lot of traction. Um, Thomas Crowther and others, uh, uh, botanists argued that planting 1.2 trillion trees could cancel a decade's worth of CO2. Um, 
And so it, it fostered a lot of debate. Uh, where would the trees be planted? What kinds of trees? How would the planting endeavors uh, interface with and draw on local indigenous knowledge of, um, uh, forest, uh, of forests and deforestation? Uh, and would people be displaced? Was there a risk of people being displaced in order to plant trees, okay? Perhaps uh, people who historically have lived in those areas and depended on uh, those ecologies. So in 1977, uh, Wangari Mathai and uh, six other women in Kenya on Women's Day decided to launch a tree planting movement in Kenya, uh, employing uh, rural women who were the most immiserated, the most marginalized uh, people in Kenya and uh, were not seen typically as political actors. Okay, they were not people to be reckoned with. They were outside of the public sphere of politics. Okay. Um, and they planted seven trees. These, these women planted seven trees and uh, um, reached out to international organizations for support. They got support from the UN Fund on Women and uh, from a Scandinavian uh, feminist movement. And so they were able initially to give the women four cents, four US cents per tree planted. And for many of these women, it was the first time they had uh, a modicum of financial independence, okay? Uh, and we know that all sorts of, um, the power to choose uh, is, is directly related in many instances to this element of, of uh, economic uh, self-sufficiency. So as it happened, this coincided with the uh, rule of President Dar uh, Daniel Arab Moy in Kenya. Uh, he was an authoritarian leader. He was pro-Western. I mean, he was seen as he was supported by the West. Um, and they clashed repeatedly with the, the women of the Greenbelt movement. Um, and then in 2004, to everybody's surprise, including her own, Wangari Mathai and the Greenbelt movement were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Okay. The movement had grown to employ 100,000 women and planted 30 million trees in Kenya, but then also in adjoining countries like uh, Uganda and Tanzania. Okay. Um, and Wangari Mathai was the first uh, African woman and also the first environmentalist um, ever to receive the Peace Prize. And I want to return to the controversy over that at the end of the lecture. Okay, so I wanted to use a couple of clips to, to give you a texture for the, the landscape, the human landscape, and uh, the, the ecological landscape. Around mid 1970s, I was already in the University of Nairobi as a lecturer. I was doing research in the field and I observed a lot of deforestation and soil loss. I was hearing many rural women complain about the fact that they did not have firewood. They were also complaining that they did not have enough water. They had put too much of their land on cash crops like coffee and tea. And people were not having enough firewood to be able to cook the kind of traditional food crops that required a lot of energy to cook. But now without energy, they were changing their cooking habits to cook highly refined foods. And highly refined foods were very rich in carbohydrates, sometimes 100% carbohydrates and no proteins and vitamins. And children were suffering from diseases associated with the malnutrition. When the women started saying that they did not have enough firewood, that's what gave me an idea. Why not plant trees? I asked the women. Yes, plant trees. And the women said, well, we would plant trees, but we don't know how. And that started the whole story of, yeah, okay, let's learn how to plant trees. <laughs> We approached the women and tried to make a relationship. 
between environmental problems and their daily problems. I had her talking about the whole country. It's going to be a desert. And she said, to improve the env environment, all what we need and we can do it is just to plant trees. And we called the foresters. They came and they talked to women. They did not really see why I was trying to teach women how to plant trees. Because to plant a tree, you need a diploma. I said, well, you, I don't think you need a diploma to plant a tree. Initially, we tried to give them seeds, and then we decided against it. We said, if we give them seeds, they'll become dependent on us. <laughs> we said, collect seeds and try to propagate the trees of the area where you are. <laughs> We said if you plant a tree and the tree survives, the movement will compensate you. Very small amount of money. It amounts to about four US cents per tree that survives. And this motivated the women. And so they just started very, very, very small, very, very small. And before too long, they started showing each other. And before we knew, the tree nurseries just started mushrooming. Na hivyo ni hivyo twale ya bere ta groove ya community kwa bere ya kugiana na sare ya miti na hatia le kamutio na kamwe kwa le kiharo todu matia le chua ate no to no ugo toro igani to ko hada miti ri ate no to hade Todo timotugo wa agekoyo atumia kuhada miti. Kwa gure ya tuwabiriria kuhada miti re. Izuwe ta atumia netuoni re, neta a break of rule. Gotuweka izuwe netuwa atuweka associated. Okay, so um, one of the things that this case does is it draws together all four uh, motifs of the Nexus course. So food security, water security, the impact of climate change on desertification and water availability, and biodiversity loss through deforestation. Okay, so you have a nexus of these issues coming to life here. And there's a, there's a proverb from the Congo that says, um, a hungry stomach has no ears. A hungry stomach has no ears. And this idea that if you're uh, desperate for food and water, um, you're, you, you set aside everything in order just to survive, okay? And so what happens is the stresses that come with climate change, with deforestation, with uh, soil uh, loss, those stresses put pressure on um, indigenous cultural systems that have environmental values and environmental practices uh, enfolded into them, okay? So what's interesting here is that uh, the women were blocked from planting trees, first of all, by um, the process of certification that foresters needed a diploma, okay? And secondly, by cultural factors, by tree planting being associated with men, uh, because again, they were the ones who got to go to the community college and get the, the uh, forestry uh, cert certificate, okay? So the uh, Green Bob movement broke with that, uh, with, with the, the protocols of professionalization that had excluded women uh, and especially rural women, okay? Thungari Mathai said, poverty is both a cause and a symptom of environmental degradation, okay? So how do you break that cycle, that feedback loop? So tree planting became a way of interrupting both the cycle of poverty and the cycle of environmental degradation. Okay? And so part of the argument of this part of the course is that 
environment for, from the perspective of environmental justice, you can't separate issues of poverty and inequality from issues of uh, environmental uh, repair. Uh, so this gives you a little bit more background to the Arab Moy region. Something called biogeography and plant ecology at Kenyatta College. And I wanted students to see Kemakia Forest, where the government was cutting the indigenous forest in order to produce timber and pulp. I was arrested in May 1982. We were detained and sent to maximum security isolation as detainees of the Moy government for the good government of Kenya. There was a regime in Kenya that was giving the impression that this country is impossible for anybody to change. One thing we knew about President Moy is that he was completely untouched by the complaints of his people. We could complain all day, it didn't matter. From 1984 to 1988, a lot of our people left the country. A lot of our people were imprisoned. A lot of our people were killed. It was uh, brutal. It was very, very powerful. It had the country in, in its grip, and it had the power and the willingness to, to use that power to crush any opposition. One of the tactics that the government uses is to make people fear authority. <laughs> when the women started, nobody was bothering them because nobody took them seriously. You know, who takes women seriously? Then sometime in the course of the years, the government realized that we were organizing women. So they started interfering with our organizing, and they demanded you have to have a license, you, have, you cannot meet, you cannot do. They harassed women a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so um the the rural women in these movements which uh, ballooned over a couple of years um were politically invisible they were not taken seriously so uh, because of their gender because uh, of their poverty and because they were rural seen as outside the spheres of influence they were able to grow and organize uh, sort of clandestinely because they were seen as outside of politics and by the time the, the Moya regime issued a law saying that you couldn't belong to both a women's organization and an environmental organization, you had to choose, it was too late. The two were entangled with each other. And uh, this, this organization had spread across the country. And I should say that, that with any political organization, you learn as much from your failures as from your successes. Um, Kenya is a, a nation of about 40 different ethnicities. And one of the things that the Green Belt Movement had to adjust to was the fact that they'd started out relatively centralized. And for both cultural and ecological reasons, they came to decentralize that. So that the people organizing uh, for, the, for the tree nurseries uh, had to be local women who spoke the local language, had their own uh, cultural traditions and also knew which trees grew best in that environment, okay? So they, they had to decentralize the movement in order to harness uh, the trust 
and also the ecological, the textured ecological knowledge of people who lived with those particular trees. Uh, and so to loop back to that earlier um, paper that I referred to by Thomas Crowther and others in 2019 about planting 1.2 trillion trees on earth, one of the questions is asked, that it gets asked is what trees and where? Um, because as we know, um, a tree is not a tree is not a tree. If you think of uh, eucalyptus, if we think of conifers, there are many places where you have plantations of trees that in a sense are anti-forests. They're, they're, they're monocultures. They are um, uh, biologically denuded. Um, and so a plantation is not the same as a forest. Uh, um, and so this is, this is a critical element of their thinking here is that to really um, uh, harness the power of the forest to regenerate itself, uh, the, the most effective way is to use local people with local environmental knowledge um, to collect the seeds uh, of that partic those particular trees in their region, okay? So this is a critical comment by Wangari Mathai. Uh, tree planting is only the entry point. The real point is civic education. And so what happens after decades of authoritarian rule, um, uh, civic institutions in society uh, get atrophied, okay? And the memory is broken of the power of civic engagement. And it is a, a sort of an important so, side story that Wangari Mathai uh, came to the US in the late 60s, and she was at a small college in Kansas, um, but was, was really um, engaged by the civil rights movement in the US. And so she saw some potential there for, for transferring and adapting the, the values and practices, the nonviolent practices of the civil rights movement in the US to the tree planting movement um, in, uh, the, the, uh, in Kenya. And so as she suggests here, she was not only interested in regenerating the forest, but in regenerating a sense of civic agency, okay? So I suggested at the beginning of the lecture that um, the, we, I wanted to talk a little bit about the symbolic tree as well as the biological tree, okay? And I wanna go back to the, Bertolt Brecht, a German poet from the World War II period. He says, what times are these in which a conversation about trees is almost a crime? For in, so, for in doing so, we maintain our silence about so much wrongdoing. Okay, so this was just at the beginning of the Nazi era where writing about trees, poetry about trees seemed trivial, seemed a kind of a denial of politics, okay? Um, and indeed, in the, in the fascist discourse of Germany at the time, blood and soil and trees, uh, there was a naturalizing, an attempt to naturalize uh, um, white supremacy in, in that uh, context. But we can also flip Brecht's quote and say, you know, what times are these in, in which a conversation about trees is necessary? Um, and what we can see from the Greenbelt movement in Kenya was that, that the environmental and public health costs of deforestation and topsoil loss were critical elements in the continued imp uh, uh, impoverishment of uh, rural people. So what does it mean symbolically to plant a tree? To plant a tree is to offer shade to unborn strangers. It's to defect from the typical time scales of politics, okay? Even if we think of democratic politics, elections every two, every four years, it takes trees much longer typically to mature than that, okay? In an era of brutally extractivist thinking, to plant a tree can be an act of civil disobedience, a secession from short-term thinking, okay? Uh, from the, the court, the, 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 the spinning wheel of digital time and the spinning wheel of the quarterly report from the, from the corporations and so forth, it um, extends our time frame uh, and, and requires a certain kind of faith in the future. Thus to plant a tree is to revive an endangered vision of both environmental time and civic agency. And so 
these, these metaphors of growth, like the metaphors of ice and, and, and snow that are mentioned in the outset of the course, uh, suffuse our language. We talk about planting the seeds of peace, cultivating change, grassroots movements, okay? Uh, these are all uh, um, metaphors, dead metaphors now. We don't really see them as metaphors. Uh, but they're rooted in uh, the origins of, uh, of, of human agriculture. Um, even economic growth, which is regarded nearly universally as an overall social good, is not necessarily so. There is growth so unequal that it heightens social conflict and increases repression. There's growth so environmentally destructive that it detracts in some from a community's quality of life. Okay, so these are these are key factors in um, the pushback that we had in Kenya at this time of economic growth for the few and immiseration for the many, uh, and that immiseration was very much tied to environmental degradation. So if we talk, one often hears about organic intellectuals, in other words, intellectuals who, rather than say coming from an ivory tower. Or have come up through the ranks of a particular movement. It could be a, 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 a women's movement, it could be a trade union movement, or any other kind of movement. Um, so they're organically connected. And so a lot of the, in a lot of the images we see of Wangari Mathai, she is a part tree, part woman. Okay, she she is an organic in, intellectual, in the sense of being rooted in the soil uh, from which she came from. So what does environmental knowledge look like and where does it come from? There were eventually in the Greenbelt movement, there were 100,000 foresters without diplomas. Um, and as this uh, indigenous leader from South Africa uh, put it, by recognizing our knowledge, they are actually recognizing our identity. Okay, and this is, this is hugely important for the way, for instance, that NGOs interface with uh, local environmental movements uh, in the global south is uh, that to recognize the environmental knowledge uh, that people possess in the first place and to thereby um, acknowledge the power of those people as uh, transformative actors. So Wangari Mathai was kind of straddling these two worlds. She was the first uh, woman in East Africa to get a PhD in biology from Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, um, which she got in the US. Um, but she also learned a lot about forestry and about the life of trees from her grandmother specifically. And so she was straddling these two worlds, trying to bring them together. And the the crucial elements of this was that women collect the water, women gather firewood, and uh, in their agricultural role are, are very often alive to the uh, loss of topsoil and the nutritional implications for the children for whom uh, culturally they are constructed as the primary caregivers very often. Um, so I want to double down on this question of intersectionalism because it, it doesn't only apply specifically to the Greenbelt movement, but it applies analogously to other movements where we're trying to forge alliances uh, in relation to overlapping concerns. Uh, so in the first lecture, I, I invoke this quote from Audre Lorde, there is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. And so from my experience in, in different kinds of social movements, the one thing that I'm absolutely convinced of is this, um, that we, we need to think and act intersectionally um, to overcome the isolation of the single issue cause. Um, and that way we tap into different uh, points of, of passion and engagement from a diverse range of constituencies. So in this case, you had the women's movement, you had the environmentalism of the poor, you had international environmental movements um, getting involved and uh, the inspiration that Ongari Mathai drew from the African-American civil rights movement. And so 
I want to ground this uh, struggle between the uh, autocratic regime and the the uh, Green Belt movement in in two key key moments. The first involved Karura Forest, which is a big uh, green lung outside Nairobi. Nairobi is a kind of mega city, uh, a bigger city in, in East Africa. And Karura Forest was publicly owned and was a vital uh, green lung and also important for, uh, for biodiversity. And what happened was the um, Arab Moy started uh, allowing people to, his cronies to uh, cut down these trees to sell them uh, for uh, timber, uh, to build golf courses, um, condos, and things like that. So there was a privatization by stealth of this, of this publicly owned forest. Um, going to shed blood because of our land, we will. We have a government in this country that is actually overseeing the destruction of forests and the grabbing of public land. Today, we are faced with a challenge that calls for a shift in our thinking so that humanity stops threatening its life support system. We are called to assist the earth to heal her wounds and in the process, heal our own. In the showdown over Karura Forest, um, the women were attacked with, with whips, shambucks, and, and machetes. And uh, um, they arrived with saplings. So they, had, they, they each arrived marching with saplings. So that became enfolded into the symbolism of their nonviolence. OK, so you have the, the um, the goon squad with their machetes and their whips and their guns. And then you had these women marching in with, with holding the saplings. And that became a very, very powerful image that sort of went uh, global uh, of the, the value systems, if you like, of these two forces as they confronted each other. Um, so there was a symbolic showdown between the axe tree and the planted symbolism, the idea of of, of uh, unregulated destruction on the one hand, and this um, biological and cultural investment in the future that the sapling represented. Uh, and so they talked about insurrectionary reforestation, a defense and the renewal of the commons in, in Karura Forest. So the second uh, case study that I wanted to look at is uh, the fate of Uhuru Park. Um, so you might have paid attention to various struggles around the world where a, a central plaza or a central park becomes a, a place that authoritarian regimes want to shut down, want to build, build on or so forth, because that is where people can assemble. Okay? We've seen this in, in Turkey, we've seen this in Belarus, we've seen this in Hong Kong, uh, many, many uh, social struggles going on in the world. So. Uhuru Park was the central park, or is the central park, in Kenya. And so the regime saw it as a, as a trouble spot, and they decided to build over it in a monumental way. Um, in 1989, the government, led by President Moy, wanted to take Uhuru Park and build a 62-story skyscraper and a four-story statue of President Moy himself, constructed using funds that we are going to be borrowed from international institutions such as the World Bank. This is a public park. It's the only place in Nairobi where you can go and lie down and nobody asks you what you are doing and nobody asks you for a fee. The movement, the Green Belt was really growing at that time. And when this information came uh, to her, she immediately came to the office and said, well, guess what? 
they are about to destroy it. the only major park in Nairobi. We cannot let it happen. And then she said, now I have an idea. I said, okay, what's the idea? I want to protest through the British government. I've written this letter, okay. The financiers were coming from abroad and they were financing something that they wouldn't do in their own uh, state. We wrote and we gave the example of how the environment in the third world countries is destroyed with the full knowledge and support of the developed countries who support dictators, who, who don't help us to overcome these dictators, and who do business with these dictators, and then hold the poor people to account. It infuriated the head of state, and it infuriated the parliamentarians, because they felt, why should she take this local issue outside of the confines of this sovereign state. So this one afternoon, Parliament was literally stopped. They actually stopped the debate that was going on to discuss me. And they had nothing but abusive language against me. They want to get personal. They want to debase your womanhood. So I said, now don't give me that. Just use the anatomy that matters right now. And that is from the neck up. Na mama moja na jitokeza. Na kwa testuri mama kwa ki Afrika lazima kwa jumu wa kwa jumu wa naume. Okay, so you can, it gives you a flavour of what she was up against in terms of the, the, the political elite, uh, the laughter, the um, attempt to get women to police one of their own. Um, and uh, it was important for her that she did was able to do an end run around the nation state and involve um, women's organizations and environmental organizations from outside without subsuming the agenda, the, the agenda that she and the rural women had worked out without subsuming those to uh, foreign environmental um, priorities, okay? Uh, and so this is probably, not a, it hasn't been a very prominent thread in the course, but I just wanted to tease out some of the ways in which gender is a, is a very uh, pertinent category to environmental nexus. So, uh, Mathai had been educated in the US, okay? Uh, so she was uh, cross-cultural, she had this cross-cultural awareness, and the uh, political elite in Kenya tried to wield that against her. Uh, they claimed that she was overeducated. These are literal quotes. Overeducated, a mad woman. She'd spent so long in America, she was un African. She had become a white woman in a black skin. Uh, she was a divorcee, which she was, who lacked a man to control her. An ungovernable woman. We saw a wayward woman. If she were a proper woman in the African tradition, she would respect men and be quiet. One parliamentarian threatened to so-called circumcise her if she ever set foot in his district. Okay, so there was a lot. She was imprisoned three times. She was uh, macheted. She, she endured a lot of persecution. Um, and I think it's, it's worthwhile uh, comparing this to the kinds of gender, gender-centric um, attacks that Rachel Carson suffered in the 60s when at a time when we had like, uh, I think 1% of uh, tenured science professors in the US were women, 1%. Um, and so Carson, again, was, was, was a, an iconoclast. Um, and some of the um, 
the vitriol leveled against Carson is, is, uh, has echoes of, of what uh, Mathai uh, endured. So Carson was uh, accused of being overeducated. Uh, she had an, uh, uh, a, a biology master's from Johns Hopkins, but because she had dependents, she didn't uh, ever complete her PhD. So she was also criticized by some scientists as being undereducated. Uh, standard uh, critique of the women, hysterical, emotional, unpatriotic. The US Secretary of Agriculture said, why is a spinster with no children so concerned about genetics? She's probably a communist. Okay, so it was, uh, the criticism was that she was undermining food security of the US relative to the Soviet Union, okay? Um, and because she didn't have children of her own, she had no right thinking about and caring about the future. Um, so, something li like uh, 40 billion hours a year is the amount that's calculated of, of uh, uh, women in sub-Saharan Africa uh, fetching and carrying water. And with cl uh, climate change, climate breakdown, and with desertification, uh, women were having to walk further and further to get the water. So it became a longer part of their day. They spent less time with their children. There were all sorts of consequences, okay? Um, this is not only happening in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. This is in Northwest India during a sustained drought there. Again, it, it's the women who are having to negotiate the, the more testing circumstances that come with, uh, with drought and, and desertification, okay? cartoon on the division of labor and who, who gets to bear the water and who gets to bear the knowledge, okay? Um, and this is from, uh, uh, from, from India where uh, you have indoor cooking on so-called chulhas, uh, is, is, is a very uh, common practice in rural areas. And as a result, uh, women are disproportionately vulnerable to um, um, respiratory illnesses, okay? And so uh, there's something like 4.7 million uh, premature deaths per year uh, that are specifically women who are cooking indoors. And this is primarily in South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa and the Pacific, okay? Uh, so there are all sorts of interesting endeavors to try to negotiate the space whereby um, less um, harmful cooking practices can be uh, encouraged uh, in relation to cultural traditions. Uh, so so it's, it's, a, it's a very complicated dance that goes on, but it's another example of the, the importance of gender as a category of environmental justice uh, in relation to um, uh, emissions. Uh, and this goes back at least as far as the 18th century. This was in like 1730, I think. Um, uh, a famous environmental martyr in the north of India. Uh, what happened was a Maharaj was wanting to add 20 rooms to his palace and he sent his men out to uh, fell wood in a nearby forest. And this woman, Amrita Devi, hugged, was the first known tree hugger. And uh, she was decapitated as were her daughters and some 360 people that day. And then the men arrived back at the Maharaja's palace. And he said, why are you so bloody? And why did it take you so long? He said, well, we, we had a lot of trouble getting to the trees because the, the, the people were hugging them. Uh, and so uh, he, he was appalled and then um, part of the cultural uh, um, law that was passed down was that this particular species of tree would never be cut again. And that has um, become part of the, the cultural heritage of this area. Okay. Similarly, some of you may have heard of the Chipka movement in India in the 1970s. Uh, again, it was women who were at the helm of this because they were largely doing the foraging and, and were dependent on the trees for fuel. Uh, and what happened was that they didn't have formal title to the forest, even though um, their ancestors had, had lived there for thousands of years. Uh, 
Uh, and so the, the, the national government had given a, I think a sport, a sport uh, company a permission to uh, cut down the uh, part of the forest. And again, these uh, women uh, served as tree huggers and ended up protecting the forest uh, uh, from, from the uh, assailants. More recently, a couple of years ago, uh, when in Poland, they started cutting down a, a publicly owned forest, uh, these, a, a group of women with small influence staged what I think is a really powerful protest that again went viral of uh, women suckling their uh, infants on the stump of a tree. Uh, and so it, it takes you in a very visceral way, I think, into the space of, um, of, of kind of speculative nonfiction that we talk about. If we think of the, lo the long life of that tree, we think of the long life of the child ahead and the, 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 the dysfunctional relationship between the felled forest that uh, has a short-lived purpose and the, the hopes for their children. David Harvey said that uh, there are two kinds of costs that capital doesn't want to bear, environmental degradation and social reproduction, who raises children, cares for the sick, et cetera. Capital tries to turn these into externalities so they don't have to pay for them. Historically, social movements have pushed the state to pay for some of these costs, okay? So um, basically, uh, the, the drive, as he suggests, of capital is to minimize costs by um, not paying for environmental degradation. That could be deforestation, it could be air pollution, water pollution. And similarly, we know that the work of care goes unpaid or underpaid. We've seen this very, very dramatically in the COVID era, and that disproportionately that work falls on women. So in closing, I just want to say a few words about the, the Nobel Peace Prize that uh, Wangari Mathai and the Greenbelt Movement won in, 19, in 2004, okay? Um, one uh, member of the uh, Nobel Prize Committee said, it's odd that the Nobel Committee has completely overlooked the unrest that the world is living with daily and has given the prize to an environmental activist, okay? So there was a lot of um, befuddlement and, and uh, condescension around the fact that an African woman who planted trees uh, was given the Peace Prize, okay? As I said, there was no precedent either for an African woman or an environmentalist getting the Peace Prize. This was 2004, so it was just a year after the US uh, invasion of Iraq. The Afghan war was, was uh, heating up. So there was all this, it was a very militarized atmosphere, a, a, a lot of uh, terrorism and counterterrorism at that time. And so some people who were very focused on peace as the opposite of war, uh, thought that this was trivializing the price. But Wangari Mathai put it this way. She said, during the rainy season, thousands of tons of topsoil are eroded from Kenya's countryside by rivers and washed into the ocean and lakes. Additionally, soil is lost through wind erosion in areas where the land is devoid of vegetative cover. Losing topsoil should be considered analogous to losing territory to an invading enemy. And indeed, if any country were so threatened, it would mobilize all available resources, including a heavily armed military, to protect the priceless land. Unfortunately, the loss of soil through these elements has yet to be perceived with such urgency, okay? So what she's focusing on is the um, pre prevention of war uh, that, that often comes from resource bottlenecks, okay? Uh, so when you have resource bottlenecks, you have people fighting over resources. Um, and the loss of topsoil becomes a critical element in that. If people lose the ability to grow crops and to nourish themselves, they are going to be more desperate and it's easier to foment conflict, okay? Uh, in building the Green Belt Movement, we sought to reintroduce a sense of security among ordinary people so they do not feel so marginalized and so terrorized by the state, okay? So there was this attempt both to introduce a, a newfound sense of security and a newfound sense of agency, of civic agency. And I thought this is a very powerful uh, piece of street art by the 
uh, artifagic, free yourself, okay? On, um, again, using this, this metaphoric connection that I talked about between the human and the tree, um, and the idea of a kind of self-severance, okay? Cutting yourself at the ankles. Uh, this is the kind of discussion we've seen a lot with, with COVID about individual freedoms. How can you reconcile individual freedoms with the collective good? Clearly, uh, uh, what Peshak is representing here is a kind of uh, uh, um, a short-term view of self-destruction um, uh, that comes from a failure to think through the integrated relationship between the human and the tree and the human collective and the forest as uh, a collectivity of trees. And so we've seen this in, in, in the art and uh, photography representing Ongari Mathai. These are the key ideas that I'd like you to think about. Um, okay, thank you.